Well, good morning. Good morning. Well, my name is Chris Quinn. I'm the youth pastor here at Portland Community Church, and we are glad you are here this morning. We are going through a series called The Church, The Hope of the World, and this is the fourth in that series that we are going to talk about the temple of God, and we're looking through different metaphors of the church in the New Testament so that we may know what it is that God has called us to do and what we are uh, called to be. And so uh, I want to start by looking at a picture. I'm going to have it Uh, we're going to put it up on the screen. And peace is something that is really hard to do and hard to find here in this world. And this picture is a case in point of that. This picture is of the Berlin Wall in 1976. So from the picture's perspective, we are look, we are standing in the west side, on the west side of Berlin, looking over towards the east side. And there's this church that's sitting right there. It was abandoned at this time and used, and they had guards up above making sure people from East Germany or East Berlin did not jump over trying to get to west the west side and on on the east side there is this statue of Christ and if you can actually look at it you can see the sidewalk right in front so basically it goes through its front yard this wall okay that divides this church and the ironic thing about this is that the church was named the chapel of reconciliation And right here, we get a very strong picture of the tendency of human beings to be hostile towards each other, to have this, these mentalities of disagreement and fighting to the point that, and then this political battle at this point that now we build up these walls and now we separate ourselves from each other. And in reality, it's also a picture of the fact that we are separated from God because of our sin, because of what we have done. And there is, as, as Paul will talk about this morning, there are barriers of hostility that need to be torn down. And so we have to ask ourselves this question this morning, how do we reconcile this kind of level of hostility? How do we have hope in a world that has this? Because I think especially right now, this is true for us in our country as we continue to see this this divide continue to grow in our, in our country of two opposing sides about what, what needs to be done, how to heal, and what do we need to see. And so how, how are these things going to happen? And so what we're going to see today is that the church because of what the gospel is, because of what Jesus has done, is to be a place of reconciliation and healing to a broken and hurting world. And so this morning, we're going to look at three results that happen when we believe in the gospel. What happens as a result and bring to bring reconciliation? So we, I invite you to turn to Ephesians chapter 2. We'll be in a, verses 11 through 22. And if you need to use one of the brown hardcover Bibles uh, in front of you, in the seat in front of you, turn to page 1174 so you know where we're going. And here's a little bit of context of the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians is one of Paul's primary letters where he writes about what the gospel is and what it is, what the implications are for the gospel, what it means for us as Christians. And one of the things he says, look at this, this is uh, verse 10 in chapter 1, it'll be on the screen, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Now, this is in the middle of a section in chapter one that's all about the spiritual blessings that result from having a relationship with Christ by giving your life to Christ. And so then he goes into chapter two, Paul does, and and then explains the gospel and basically says, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. You had no hope. You were objects of wrath. But now because of Christ, because of God being rich in love and mercy has made you alive together with Christ. And so that this hope of the gospel, this beautiful idea of what God can do in a life is where we find this section that we're going to look at this morning. But we also need to clarify what the temple is. In the Old Testament, the temple was God's dwelling place in the country of Israel. And it was the place where the priest would go to meet with God to to, uh, orchestrate some of these sacrifices in order for sins to be forgiven for the people. Now, I watched this really cool video from the Bible Project guys. I've talked about them before. They have this video called Heaven and Earth. And one of the things they explain, it's explaining like what that's all about. And one of the things they talk about is the temple was this place of the overlapping between God's space and our space. And I love the way that that's put. And that it's, and the temple was supposed to be this place where those two things overlap because they separated when, there, when sin entered the picture in Genesis chapter three. And so the temple became this place. Now, 
Jesus himself referred to him like as referred to himself as the temple. It was this really interesting thing for him to do that. He was talking about his body, but he was also talking about the fact that he was the embodiment of that overlap between God's space and our space. And that what ends up happening because of what Jesus did by dying on the cross and rising from the dead to bring us new life as we just sang about in that amazing song that what happens now that when we put our faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit dwells in us, and then we become beacons of God's presence here on earth. And so that is the point. Even though we have had sin in the past, that putting our faith in Christ now turns us into that because of what Jesus did. And so let's go ahead and look. Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to look first at verses 11 through 13. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So I've said this before and I've been up here and I'll say it again. A, be- a, a great Bible study tip is when you see this word, therefore, always ask the question, what's the therefore, therefore, okay? And so what it does, it's a marker that says, okay, what I just said now has this implication that I'm going to explain. So what did he just say? Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 has this really beautiful explanation of the gospel, of basically of that song we just sang, In Christ Alone. It's this amazing description. And again, I'll say it again. It was the fact that we were dead in our transgressions and sins. We had no hope of being made righteous before God, but God being rich in mercy and love made us alive together with Christ. So putting our faith in Christ makes us alive together with Christ and saves us from our sins, but also brings us into this relationship with God. And so therefore, here is this implication. And look at what he says. Remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised. Now that term, being called uncircumcised was for Gentiles because the Jews had this, um, had this belief that because circumcision was this display of their devotion to God and like a symbol of the fact that they were set apart by God, they believed that because they had that, that they, and had this relationship with God, this very special relationship with God, that they were better than everyone else. They had this elitist kind of mentality. And so they would think in this way that There are Jews and there are Gentiles. And Gentiles are basically anyone who is not a Jew. So if you, unless you have some Jewish heritage that I don't know about, if I don't know you, we're all Gentiles in this place. We are people who have not been Jewish. And so when we see this, they had this relationship with God. And and, and remember, they had this very arrogant view, the, the Jews, about that they were exclusively the people of God. When numerous times God would tell them, it wasn't because of anything special about you that I chose you. It's just because I love you. So he just chose them because he loves them. And again, it's not because there was something special about them. He just chose to use them in this manner. And so now there are these five privileges that Paul lays out here that the Gentiles were not a part of because they were not brought into the faith of the Israelites. Look at this. This is verse 12. Remember that at that time you were, here's one, separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. Those five things. Those are pretty depressing kind of things. It's basically giving this concept that you were totally separate from God. You had no hope. You had no um, stake in the life of God and, and the business of God and what he was up to in the world. You had no reason to have a relationship with God. And I think it's actually really important for us as Christians to constantly remember where we used to be. Not as a sense of like trying to pay penance for that and to continually, you know, apologize for things to God because we, we have been forgiven. We ask for forgiveness. But to be able to see and have compassion on people who are still kind of there because Here's the reality. Paul says this in Romans 5, 8, that Christ died for us while we were still sinners. So for us to be able to remember what it, what it was like to, to be separated from God, to not know Christ, gives us this ability to have mercy and compassion on other people and to recognize that it wasn't us. It wasn't, we didn't make anything happen so that we could have this relationship with God. It was all based on 
Christ's own work that we now put our trust in. So that is the only thing that we have faith in. And so look at what he says. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And so this is, it's this beautiful reversal of fortune that happens because of, of the gospel that now those of us who were far away, who were separated from God, had no possible connection with him, could not have been saved on our own work, that we have been brought near by the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ paid the penalty of our sins that were due to us so that we could be brought near to God. And it's not, we, we need to remove these notions that Christianity is just the a forgiveness of sins, of get out of, a get out of jail free kind of card or fire insurance. What it is, is to be brought near, be brought into the family of God, to be brought into him so that we can have a closer relationship with him. It is really important for us to understand this. And so this is our first result that happens is that we are reconciled to God. We are reconciled to God. And that word reconciled, we need to understand that it is this idea of two opposing sides coming together as one. And so we have been, because of our sin, because of what we have done, we have separated ourselves from God. And so by putting our faith in Christ, we are now reconciled back to him, back to the way that things were meant to be in the garden, in that relationship where no, sin is not the barrier anymore. Sin is not dividing us from God, but now we have a relationship with him once again. And so that is the first result of what happens when we believe in Jesus Christ. Let's continue, verse 13, or verse 14. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Now look who is the source of the peace. So the one who inaugurated it, the one who started it, the initiator is Jesus. He himself is the one who brings peace. It is only possible through him that peace can happen. So when we see a situation like what I show with the Berlin Wall or even looking at our country and the divide that is continuing to happen, the only thing that can possibly bring peace is if we all truly submit ourselves and believe in the gospel, following Christ and saying, God, your will be done in my life, because that is what brings peace. Because look at what he says. Who has made the two groups, and that's the Jews and Gentiles, he has made the two groups one. He has made these two opposing groups one. He has reconciled them back together and look at what he says. This is beautiful. And has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. That wall of hostility, most likely what Paul is referring to is this wall that actually was there in the temple in Jerusalem that told the Gentiles, if you come any further, if you come into this part of the temple, you are now under penalty of death. Man, that's crazy. I think if a church ever did that nowadays, man, that would cause a huge stir across our country to say, oh no, these certain people cannot come in. It was not, this is not what God designed for them to do. But, and so as a result, this, I think this would create a little bit of hostility, right? Like if you can't come into God, you can't come into the temple this far. And so this is, if you'd come in, it's on penalty of death. When God truly wanted Israel to be a city on a hill, a beacon of his kingdom to the rest of the world so that they could, other people from around the world could come in and see what God is like and they could come to know him and put their faith in him to provide for them for salvation. So he has, he has done this, but look at how he's done this. Verse 15, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. You see, the law, again, was another source of that arrogance from the Jews that because they had God's commands and laws, that they were special for some reason. And we get this view of the law because we hear the word, and so this is what we think. That the law, in some way, if, if we follow it, it now means that we, are, we get righteousness like given to us. And like, this is what the Jews believe, that, that righteousness would be given to them. It would be imparted to them simply because they followed the rules and now they would be able to have a, recon a reconciliation with God. 
But in reality, what the law was, was just a temporary placeholder, a teacher that revealed to us and said to us, this is where you have sin. This is where you need to deal with it. And you can't do it in yourself. So you need to trust and believe in God that he is going to provide the sacrifice necessary so that you can be saved. And so by Christ setting it aside, by Christ coming in the flesh and dying on the cross for our sins, being raised up to new life, by doing all of that, the whole gospel story, what he has done is he has, uh, like, he has destroyed that mentality that, that we could now have the law and be able to become righteous. But really, now we can look to Christ that he has, he has fulfilled the, what the law pointed to, that he would come and save people from their sins. It's really this amazing concept. So this is how Jesus has brought these two groups together because it's no longer about the law. It's no longer about this dividing wall. It's now God bringing all people unto himself, as Paul said in, in chapter one, to bring unity under Christ. And so he continues, look at, again, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. It's this beautiful idea that God's purpose, the reason he was doing all of this was to create unity, was to bring this whole new, new humanity, this redeemed humanity from what they used to be, bring them together to be one, and thus it brings peace. There's no longer this hostility. There's no longer this disagreement. And, in, and look at this, verse 16, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. Hostility is a result of sin. And so because Jesus took on all sin, took on all our sin and iniquities and transgressions, all of that onto himself on the cross, thus hostility as well is one of those things that died on the cross with Jesus, was crucified with Christ. And so this should no longer shape who we are as a church, who we are as a people of God. Hostility is done away with. And so this is actually our result number two of believing in the gospel is that we are reconciled to each other. We are brought together to be this family of God, the, this group of people who are reconciled to each other, who are now more focused on God than any, on anything else that is going, around, going on around us. Because look at what he says in verse 17. He came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near. So this gospel is for everybody. It's not for just this select group of people. It's for every single person on this earth. Everybody. This is available for. And that word, I love that he says this word preached. What that word actually is, is where we get the word gospel from. It's, it literally means good news. So he, it's literally saying he came and gospeled peace to you who are near and to you who are far away. That's a beautiful concept. And so as a result, because of this now being brought near, we now have access. So whereas beforehand, we, would, we needed a representative to stand before God to become ritually clean and spiritually clean on the inside to be able to come before God now, because we have given our lives to Christ and his spirit dwells in us and makes us clean, now we have total access to God. We all have total access to him. And this is, again, the whole point of all of this is that we would be reconciled to each other, tear down the barriers of hostilities and any issues that we might have. And more importantly, we have been saved as well to be a people of God that works together. Instead of in our little camps, and our little divisions that we think this is way, the way we need to do it, we need to reconcile all those things and say, no, we need to work together. And there's a little bit of an implication here as well. Um, I, I did this last week and I do this because I love all of you and I want to teach you about what God's word says about, about church attendance. Because church attendance, we get into this mentality, I said last week, about fulfilling a quota. And God's not going to, you know, when you come to see God someday, he's not going to say, okay, you did not come to church 75% of the time, so we have a problem here. That's not, that's not what he's going to do. What he's going to do is he's going to say, were you faithful to what I called you to do? Did you use the gifts that I gave you to serve the kingdom? And as well, this is one of the things we are called to do as a church, to stir each other on and to encourage each other so that we may grow. 
So that's why it's important for not just church attendance, but also church involvement, that you would be part of a community group, that you would be part of a small group, a discipleship relationship where someone's teaching you about what it means to follow Christ. That's why it's important to do those things because we are participating and then we can build each other up and encourage each other. Because we can't have, we, we have this weird mentality in our culture, this individualistic mentality that's like, well, it's between me and Jesus. I, I, this is what I need to do. This is how I'm going to do it. I even heard it on the radio this morning on the way in where I was listening to a Christian radio and they said, well, if this is your church this morning, no, that's not right. <laughs> you don't, that's not what that means. You don't get to have church on your own in your car listening to worship music. That's not what church is. Church is the expression of all those who have been saved by Christ, reconciled to each other, coming to worship God together, to stir each other on so that we may grow and know Christ more because of our relationships with each other. We all need each other. I need you. You need me. You need each other. And it's this beautiful thing that God has created in this church and in, in his church. And so we need to recognize it is really important for us to step up and say, I'm going to be here because I need you. I need my brothers and sisters in Christ to encourage me, to help me grow so that, so that I may know Christ and so that I can do what he has called me to do. Let's continue verse 19. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So then he says this word consequently, and it's basically as a result. As a result of the fact that we have been reconciled to God and we have been reconciled to each other, we are no, you are no longer foreigners and citizens. Remember, his audience is Ephesians, and these are mostly Gentiles. So he's saying, you are no longer what I said you used to be, that you, you were excluded from Israel, citizenship in Israel, that you were separated from Christ without hope, without God in the world, without the covenants of the promise. You now are citizens and included into the, the family of God and with God's people. And that concept of f fellow citizens, it's this beautiful idea that Paul continues to, it says a lot throughout his letters. And it's this idea that we now live as citizens of God's kingdom wherever we go. That we say, I'm going to live because I'm going to live in this way because I represent Jesus. I represent the, I represent him because he now lives in me. And so I need to live in a manner that reflects him. It's not, again, we believe this idea of we are forgiven of our sins and someday we get to go to heaven. That's, those are correct, but it's not the whole story because the whole story is that we get to then be transformed by the spirit so that we may live the life that God has called us to live, which is to live Christ's life and to glorify him with all of our lives. And so he uses this beautiful building concept that Peter used in uh, 1 Peter 2. We talked about that a few weeks ago. And so he uses kind of the similar, a very, like the exact same wording where he talks about Christ himself as the chief cornerstone. And that cornerstone set the edges for the building. And it's basically this stone that would be put down. And if the, st the cornerstone was off, so the rest of the foundation would be off. And so the rest of the building. And so as a result, Paul, they're using this imagery to say Christ sets the edges. Christ is the one who dictates what it is, what the church is and what it needs to be and what it needs to do. And for us as well, individually, what we need to be and what we need to do. And so if, if we don't have that right, if we miss that, then the building goes off. The building doesn't become what it's supposed to be. And so Christ becomes that cornerstone, that chief and precious cornerstone that we trust in and believe in and set the edges. And then the foundation is then built upon by the apostles and prophets, the ones that Jesus chose to proclaim his message and spread it throughout the world. But then it's this crazy thing that he says. Look at verse 22. And in him, you too are being built together being built together into this building that, in verse 21, rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And so this is, this is the crazy reversal of fortune here, that not only were at one time the Gentiles completely excluded from the temple, but now 
The church being the temple is being built together with Jews and with Gentiles that are being a part of this church. And remember what I said earlier about this temple. The temple was to be an overlapping of God's space and our space. And the ultimate goal of what God does in our lives is that we would become pockets of his presence here on earth. That we would, because we have put our faith in him, this, the Holy Spirit now dwells in us, the end of 22, to, to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. The Holy Spirit now dwells in us. And so we get to be beacons and representatives of God's kingdom here on earth. And what is that mission that we are called to do? We are called to reconcile others to God. That is result number three. We are to reconcile others to God. The ministry of reconciliation has been given to those of us who believe in Christ. And when he says this, in him you too are being built being built together. It's this continual building. It's this assumption that it's going to continue to be built, to continue to add to people. So this is our job, is to go out there and now say, I am going to go and try and find people to come and know Christ. That is my job as a Christian. That is my main calling. That is what I need to be doing. And you might say, well, I'm I'm not an evangelist. That's not something that I do. I'm not a person that's going to stand up and tell people about Jesus. When I was in high school, I went to this youth conference. And this youth conference like celebrated this one guy who came out and he said, yeah, I stood up on the dining table or one of the tables in my lunchroom and uh, preached the gospel and 20 people were saved right there. And I remember thinking in my head, but I have like crippling social anxiety. That sounds terrifying. I can't do that. No way. Even if it's not your gifting to stand up and talk in front of people, it is still your calling to step up and talk and, and share your faith. It just doesn't have to be in every, like, the same way that you know, someone who it's their job to do it or it's their main calling. You can do it within relationships. You can do it in the way that you live your life and then be able to ha open up an opportunity to share the gospel. It is a non-negotiable part of our job description as Christians to be sharing the gospel with people that we know and to take opportunities to be pockets of his kingdom. Look at this. Look at this, 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 19. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and look at this, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. The message of reconciliation of people, of people who once were separated from God have now been brought into a relationship with God and so their sins are no longer counted against them. This is the ministry that he has left to us and this is what we are called to do as the temple of God. It's to be a, in this church, it has an individual and a corporate implication. The corporate implication for us as a church is this place is to be a place of hope, of healing, that there should be no hostility so that we can truly represent what we talked about last week to love one another as Christ has loved us. Thus, people will know that we are his disciples. But this also has an implication for you individually that you now are to be the, uh, an example of that wherever you go, in your neighborhood, in your job, when you go to the grocery store, when you go to get gas, even when the guy in traffic cuts you off, which is really hard, I'll be honest. Like, it's supposed to be at all times, you are always, I, I hate to say it this way, but it's, just, but it's true, but you are always on call as a Christian. You are always on duty. You're always clocked in. Because the mission is to be a minister of reconciliation. We are called to be this way for all people. And so whatever it is that we are doing, we are to filter our daily activities through this idea of my job is to bring reconciliation to this world, to open up that opportunity and to see God move and God work. Because truly, we also need to understand this. It is God alone who can do that work to actually change people's hearts. But it is our job to at least step up and give people the opportunity to respond and to know Christ. And so I want to close with, with a picture. I want you to think about this, to get a picture of what the gospel does to a person. 
and how when they understand this, that God's heart is for the world to see the world saved and to see all people come and be reconciled to God and reconciled to each other and to be reconcilers for the world. When a person understands this, what they do. The woman on the screen, this is Elizabeth Elliot. She recently passed away and Elizabeth Elliot has one of the most heartbreaking but also God-glorifying stories you will ever hear. Elizabeth Elliot married her husband, Jim, in the 50s and them and four of their married couple friends went down to Ecuador to start a mission to reach this, this group called the Haurani tribe and they were an unreached people group, meaning that they had never heard the gospel before. This is a totally new group. But they also knew before they went in that this group uh, was cannibal, was cannibalistic. Okay? So, yeah, real terrifying, real scary. But they decided because Christ was worth it, because they loved Jesus enough and they wanted to see other people be saved that they were going to go for it. Well, a few days after one of the first contacts that they had, the five men all went missing. And it turned out they had been killed. They had been killed by this tribe. But Elizabeth, Elliot, and some of the other women decided that even though that had happened, that they weren't going to let that be the deciding factor about letting these people be saved. And so she took her 10-month-old child with her into the village to share the gospel. You know what happened? They came to know Christ through her life. And it was, it's an amazing story. Um, read it, the book where you get to read all about this. is called Beyond the Gates of Splendor. Or if you want to see the movie, it's called The End of the Spear. That kind of talks about it. And so she gives this embodiment of what it means to count the cost to say, I am going to give my life to Christ. I am submitting myself to him. And I'm going to be a minister of reconciliation that tries to bring healing and hope to a broken world. Because truly there are bigger fish to fry in our world than these hostilities and these disagreements and these problems that we might have. The most important thing that we could be focused on is the fact that this gospel is meant for the whole world and we are to see all, we want to see all people saved and come to an, a relationship with Christ. So to close, let me summarize what we've, all, what we've said this morning. By believing in the gospel, we are reconciled to God and each other and as a result, we become a dwelling place of God and ministers of God's reconciliation to others. Let's pray.